Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor, Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is just to eat meat and that's what you should do. But if uh, you're hiking or road tripping or stuck at work and you want something nutritious that is just meat, fat, and possibly salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. I like this product not only because it is pure meat, but also because I really want the carnivore market to thrive as well. The more we support meat-only products, the more people will make meat-only products, and this will bring us into the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to check out, then take a look and use my discount code HTC to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right. Thanks, guys. I was just saying that um, I was listening to the podcast, the latest one with Dr. Paul Mason. Um, what the hell? Morphine in dairy? Like, what was he yeah. talking about there? Is that like something that's added or is this like a naturally occurring thing? It's, it's, a, it's an opiate analog. So, you know, it's not like... Um... You know, it's not, it's not morphine itself, but it, it's, you know, similar enough. And it hits on those morphine receptors, those opioid receptors. And so okay. could, could potentially slow down the, the motility of your gut, which is how opiates cause you to be constipated because they just slow everything down. They dry out more, but that, of course, that's not on a carnivore diet, right? Because if you have enough fat in your diet, there'll be fat in your stools and it doesn't matter how long it takes. And, um, but also the, you know, sort of an addictive nature to it, you know, in a calming, soothing sort of experience that, uh, you know, may be beneficial to, you know, uh, babies nursing and things like that. Of course. And I guess it sort of uh, explains why people get so upset when you try and take their cheese away, you know, <laughs> like, that's my cheese, yeah. it's a problem. Man. Yeah. Well, you know, and there's something, you know, that and the carbohydrates or, you know, one or the other is, yeah. Anytime I'm drinking raw milk, like I do not want to stop. <laughs> and so yeah, like, that's, yeah. a, that's a problem for me. And so I, you know, I have to be a big boy and recognize that and stay away from it. Yeah. And it's hard enough to get raw milk in Australia anyway, being mm. like illegal or whatever. Like how crazy is that? Yeah. It's probably easier to get meth, you know, like it's small yeah. supply. Dude, you know? I'll go talk to my neighbor, bro. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's, it's crazy how that works. Like there's certain things that are, are, more criminalized than than like actual illicit drugs and uh and it's just and it's like it's like food you like why 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 do you care what food i eat you know mm. yeah it's very strange yeah. oh man and that's why like i don't know if you guys have been following some of that world economic forum stuff with, about the mm. the meat yeah, a little and uh, i heard some guy talking about he wanted to reduce up to like a billion people eating meat and direct them to non-animal source protein to a, a, a higher protein it's more tastier protein he didn't say i'm assuming yeah. it's crickets or something but yeah uh, or or just that nonsense plant-based yeah, protein I think it'd be I mean, that, that's that's dying out too uh, it's whatever he's invested in i'm sure you know whatever whatever companies he owns that's probably what is is good for the world to to yeah. go towards you know <laughs> And, uh, and getting a billion people in, in his market share, I'm sure that's exactly what he feels very strongly would be good to happen. Mm, yeah. Mm. There are yeah, other compulsory bastard. products that um, yeah. with big margins that, <laughs> that have been pressed upon us recently as well. Mm. And, um, and you have to kind of follow the money back and it all starts to make sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I, th I think that's exactly what's going on with, with trying to sabotage the prices of meat. And, you know, there's, there's something like a dozen different um uh, animal, you know, slaughterhouses, processing plants, abattoirs in America, like just randomly burned down, like in the span of a couple of weeks, so like, you know, mm -hmm. they just all just like, randomly had electrical, you know, short circuits and things like that. Probably not. I mean, you, you never know, but I mean, it's, it's a pretty strange coincidence and, uh, and, and all these other, other factors and weird taxes that are coming into play to make meat obscenely more expensive. Um, there was one in Queensland, they were talking about uh, putting in a $3,500 per cow um, methane tax. So all this methane that they're producing, $3,500. And I was talking to a rancher and he was just like, that is every single penny that we sell a cow for. Yeah, so how much like, a cow costs. That, that's it. And so, yeah. you know, you know, that, that they're making no money or they basically have to double the price of everything. So instantly bang, that doubles at the, at the price of the, of the rancher, which is going to, you know, once it goes up, up the chain with all the different middlemen and things like that and getting added 
uh, added costs and things like that. It's just going to you know, quintuple. And so I think that, that a lot of these, these people are heavily invested in things like beyond meat or whatever, have some sort of agenda somewhere. And, um, you know, the beyond meat stuff, it, it, it's, it's still way inefficient and it, it still costs twice as much to put on a shelf and they have to sell for twice as much. So just instantly right there, like we, we, they've got to think of ways to get this more expensive because they're like, well, you know, we have to, we have to compete. We have to get this competitive, but instead of making their product better or getting their product less expensive, they're just trying to sabotage meat and make meat more expensive. That's my, that's my suspicion. Anyway, it's just a bit odd that all of these things are happening at the exact same time. And um, just as, as an aside on that methane thing, that's, that's a bit of an absurdity because it's, it's the cows don't make methane. First of all, they're not like creating matter, right? It's the, the breakdown and degradation of fiber that produces methane from the bacteria. So it's the bacteria breaking down the fiber and producing methane as a byproduct, as well as short chain fatty acids, which the cow then, then absorbs and they burp out the, the methane. Um, that methane is going to be produced either way, because if that fiber is just falls on the ground and gets degraded naturally, it's the same it's the same bacteria breaking that down, you know, termites get it, whatever, whatever animal gets it, whatever bug or, or bacteria get it, it still comes down to that breakdown process and it produces methane. So regardless of where it happens, the breakdown of, uh, of um, cellulose turns into methane, unless you burn it and then it turns into other things. And that, those are the two options. You either, you either feed it to a livestock or the farmer burns it to make way for the next, next year's crop. So what do you want? You know, I mean, mm. it's just, this is, um, this is a bit silly when you're, when you're taxing a natural process. Yeah, man, you know? it's madness. Yeah. I mean, there was no Buffalo tax when there was 60 million Buffalo you know, <laughs> roaming through the hundreds, United States. Hundreds, hun hundreds, over hundred million. Yeah. You know, and and you're going to, you're going to tax um, uh, plants at night when they produce CO2. Yeah. They do that. Bushfire know? tax. Imagine how much yeah. carbon comes yeah. out of a bushfire. Right. Well, we should probably right. tax the politicians that don't know how to, you know, you know, deal with forest man uh, management. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Things. You know, we should do that. You know, like, it, well, in WA, they do that. You know, they clear out brush and do little small fires to burn out the things before mm. it builds up too much. New South Wales, they don't. And so they had that massive, massive, massive uh, set of bushfires. And it was, it was a catastrophe. It was an absolute disaster. That doesn't really happen in places that that they manage their, their forest life like that. So... Mm. And why well, don't they talk about regenerative farming? Like mm. when when does that come into the picture where it's actually helping the earth? And you know, like mm. you don't hear this this argument. Like people just saying, like, yeah, it's cows, farts, and burps are the things mm -hmm. to, to be scared of now. And you know, but I feel like I'm I'm with you, man. It's beyond mm. burgers. It's these these elites, these corporations. They're the things to be wary of, not the cows, man. Mm -mm. Yeah, there was a there was a good uh, meme I saw someone say, uh, someone post um, that said uh, said that you know they're saying that cows are bad you know for the environment. And they have a picture of like a bunch of cows in a field, and they're like, cows are the environment. You know, like, what are you talking about? And you know they want they want to replace this natural process with a bunch of you know chemicals and and processed garbage that. You know, whether or not it's good for us, which it's not, you know, it's, mm. it's still an industrial process. You know, you're saying, and this is to, to save nature. This is to try to help the environment. This didn't, didn't exist in the environment. This didn't exist mm. in nature. This is all brand new stuff. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's strange to say that this helps the natural process when it has never been the natural process, you know, and, um, you know, people are just getting, you know, goaded by this and, and sucked in. And unfortunately, you have a lot of very, very well-meaning people that get very, very hurt and you know, physically upset by these sorts of things. And they go out on, on these crusades, mm -hmm. um, you know, these, these like different vegan uh, people and animal rights activists, they're like, this is evil, this is cruel and all these sorts of things. Like maybe, you know, and there, there's, there could definitely be way of ways of improving things, especially in certain places like in, in, in Asia, they are pretty horrible to their animals. Um, totally on board with that, but they forget the other side of it where what's the alternative, you know, compared to what, what are we comparing this to? What are we doing this to? Because when you compare it to animal, you know, food, uh, monocrop agriculture, 
you know, that's devastating to the environment. 55% of Borneo's rainforests are gone now. They've replaced it with palm seed uh, oil crops. And, and, and the vegan sort of proponents that are, you know, sort of puppeteering these poor people that have, are very well-meaning are saying, oh, well, you know, it's not, it's not really what it looks like. You know, they're taking down trees, sure, but they're replacing them with trees. So same, same. Absolutely not. That is not an environment. That is not a, a robust uh, ecosystem. And the animals are dead now. Like, you know, the, the amount of orangutans that have been killed in those rainforests is ridiculous because they bulldoze these trees down. All the animals and orangutans fall down to their death and they have a horrible time dying and they're run over by tractors and things like that left for dead. That's wow. terrible. And that's been going on for decades, you know, to grow plants, not, not, you know, farm beef. Um, and then there's animals that come in and mess with those crops. They get killed. You know, <laughs> they don't want you messing with their crops because that that's money. And so, you know, there was a university of new South Wales study in 2011 that showed that, um, to produce one pound, one kilo of animal-based protein, you know, versus plant-based protein, you had to kill 25 times the amount of sentient animals to produce the kilo of plant-based protein. So you're actually making a far greater impact and, and devastating animal lives much, much worse when you, when you go uh, for plant agriculture and, um, and you're, first of all, it's not bioavailable. It's not um, as nutritious, but it's also just not as good for the environment. It's not as good for the animals. Like there's no, there's no perfect system. Like something has to die for us to live. That's just the nature. I wish it wasn't. So like, that would be great, but you know, it, that's not the case, you know, and we, and we do have to do something so we can do it the best we can. And I agree, you know, regenerative agriculture, you know, that that's returning nutrients to the earth and, and, and allowing ecosystems to, to survive and thrive. Uh, you know, um, Alan Savory's proven this. I mean, he's, he's, He's literally reversed deserts all over the world. It's reproducible. He's been doing it for 40 years, teaching other people how to do it. And it works every time. So when you have, you know, an experiment that you do and you publish, oh, that's, that's great. Normally you have people, the peer review literature used to be someone else would do it and they would copy your experiment and say, yes, this is reproducible. This actually works. And uh, peer review processes is, is completely corrupted now, but that, that used to be part of it. And, and you, you would confirm, yes, this is, this is actually true. You know, we, this is reproducible. And so that's something you usually need at least, at least uh, two of those. So you have to reproduce it. So Savory has been re reproducing this for 40 years himself and others, you know, uh, ind independently. So, I mean, this, this helps and this works. And this is something that you know, people say is like, well, you can't, you can't support, you know, all these billions of people just on me. It's like, I'm sorry, but like, that's the only way we're going to support them. That's the only way we're going to support the planet. That's the only way we're going to return uh, all these nutrients to the ground and and, and revitalize that uh, the ecosystem. That's it. That's the only way. You can't do it with plant agriculture or anything mm. else. It's animals. That's it. All these animals can live amongst each other as well. You know, mm. you can have chickens and goats and pigs and all sorts of things and cows in the same paddock. And, yeah, uh, and, and, and sheep and cow eat different kinds of grass. You can have them in the same pasture as well. And they do very well with the you know the uptick in veganism and vegetarianism is it a coincidence that autoimmune disorders and diabetes and cancers and anxiety and depression this is all going up mm. like it's to, to say we can't eat, eat meat like to tell me that now when i've actually got a reference of how good i can feel and how much i can thrive like there's no way I would be going back to anything else. Like it's, it's made all the way. There's there, there I honestly feel there is no other way. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, especially when you're, when you have an illness like that, you know, it's, it's, you know, and I do, I do agree with you. I mean, we, we see this thing, this massive increase in, in prevalence of autoimmune issues and other diseases. And, and people say, well, we probably just didn't notice. It was probably already there. It's like, well, you clearly never lived with one of these diseases that you clearly never had a family member with autism. You clearly never had uh, Crohn's or also colitis or rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, you probably had rheumatoid arthritis the whole time. You just didn't notice. Yeah, I bet, you know, idiot. <laughs> and like, I mean, that, that's just an insane thing to say. And uh, what about obesity? You know, we, we just, we just didn't notice that, that you know, 30% of, of uh, people in Western countries were morbidly or not morbidly obese, but overweight or obese. I mean, we just didn't notice that. We just didn't, we just didn't check. No, no, of course not. That's ridiculous. And so, you know, yeah, the, this is, um, 
uh, I think is very, very clear. And, and you see in vegan populations uh, that things like, you know, mental, uh, mental disorders and other diseases, they're much more prevalent, autoimmune issues as well. And uh, autism is much more prevalent in uh, vegan and vegetarian households. So uh, I think there's a, a direct causal link uh, to that, eating the wrong thing and getting the wrong problem, right? You know, you have a, you know, zoos, they have those signs in the parks that say, don't feed the animals, you know? And you say, oh, okay, because it, why? Because it makes them sick. You don't feed them, this, right? And it's always been funny to me. You don't feed the animals the thing you're eating. Yeah. You know, yeah. When, when you think about that, I remember thinking about when I was a kid, it was like, don't feed the animals. Like, don't feed the, like what I'm eating, like, that's a weird thing to say, you know? And, um, you know, and, and the, the information is right there. It's all, it's, it's right there in front of us. And it's just, you know, we just, we just aren't looking at it. Yeah. Did you guys ever um, at any point in your lives go vegetarian or anything like that at any know. point? No, <laughs> well, not. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, um, no, I've always been very big on meat. You know, like one time I did watch, it was, there was this, this movie called uh, Faces of Death, which sounds a lot more dark and horrible than it is. Uh, it was pretty dark and horrible, but the purpose of it was, it was this pathologist who said like, you know, we're so separated from our food. We're so separated from death. You know, it used to be that pe- this was a, this was something that people knew about from an early age, you know, they would, you know, kids would be at wakes and, and, um, you know, and, and different, um, you know, funerals and see the body laid out and all these sorts of things. Um, and, you know, people lived on farms, they produced their own food and livestock and, and so forth. People knew about this and it's just like, we've sort of gotten away from that. I think that's actually damaged our society. I think it's important for people to see these sorts of things and to understand it. And I actually think he's right on that. You know, a big part of the vegan vegetarian movement is they're just like, so aghast that anyone could hurt an animal. Like, well, if you had to do this yourself, like you never would, you really, you never would just like the entirety of humanity did forever. You know, that's how people did it. People did kill their own animals. They, they grew and raised and, and slaughtered their own animals. That's how it worked. You know, they're like, oh, you wouldn't, you would never hurt an animal. If it was you, you just want to play with it and cuddle its little face, you know, maybe, you know, but people do still hunt every single day, you know? And so that's a bit silly. So in this, that movie, they, they showed a lot of these things. Um, and, uh, and some of it were like, you know, people just being stupid and, getting too close to animals in like uh, Yosemite or something like that and getting taken out. And it was like take on, on camera, which is, it was pretty rough to see. And then others were slaughterhouse and they like showed these things going on. And it's like, that's a lot to take in when you're 13, you know, you know, Oh my God. I remember thinking, I was just like, okay, yeah, maybe I just don't want to eat meat. I think that lasted an afternoon, you know? And like, <laughs> and I was just like, I was just, I was like, Oh, well, you know, and I was just like, I'm like, ah, yeah, we're having chicken tonight. So I'm probably going to eat that, you know, and, um, you know, yeah, it didn't last too long, but you know, I understand the sentiment. I cer- I certainly understand the sentiment and I wish there was a nicer way to do these things, but unfortunately there's not, but you know, the ways, the ways that we have in slaughterhouses are as near instant death as, as it is possible to get at this point, you know, and, and, you know, that's something that people have always recognized, um, you know, native Americans and other, other people all over the place, you know, when you would hunt, you'd kill an animal, you'd say a prayer for it. And you'd, you know, you know, thank its spirit that it's, you know, given up its life to feed your family. Um, you know, this is where things like, you know, halal meat and kosher meat comes in thousands of years, you know, uh, you know, especially with kosher a tradition of saying a prayer and thanking and blessing the animal before, before you kill it, because it's important and people respect and understand that. So, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a very good sentiment. Well, uh, it's, it's good to be back. I think we should, I should do some sort of intro. We've got Scotty Brizzle um, here, who is a comedian and a carnival joining Dr. Chafee and myself. Uh, and we're just taking the conversation wherever it goes. I mean, there's, there's no structure. Hopefully my internet yeah. will be better. And we'll just, we'll just keep going. Yeah. Well, we should, we should, we should um, sort of up and ask, yeah, Scotty, tell us a bit about yourself and how you how you came to Carnivore and why why you did so. Cool. Yeah, I uh, I guess I've I've been sick for a lot of my life, but I just didn't really know it. Um, I didn't have that reference point of um, how good I could feel. So I thought just having gut issues, joint issues, skin issues, anxiety and depression was just normal. That's just what a bitch life is, you know. So, but um, I soon learned that wasn't the case from you know all my other friends and that just thriving. So, um, 
but I was also brought up on like the standard Australian diet. So just <laughs> shit, like refined sugar, carbs, processed packaged food. Like uh, I remember one time uh, doing sport for school and we went down to the basketball courts and um, everyone's bringing out their water and their Gatorade and that. And here I bring out like a 1.25 oh, wow. bottle of Coke. And um, yeah, yeah, I was that guy. And the coach, the basketball coach was so like that look. I'll never forget that look. He, he burnt through my soul with that look, you know, and I see why I don't blame him. So that was um, a lot of my sort of uh, early adolescence days, um, severe reflux on proton pump inhibitors from an early age. Um, you know, that, that was just mm. the norm. And um, it sort of really kicked off about five or six years ago, though, when I, um, <laughs> I was at this food carnival, right? And I rocked up after work, so I was late. And they just had this like chicken wing eating competition, but like with hot wings. So this chili sauce I had on, they had the three hottest chilies in the world. So like Carolina Reaper, Ghost Pepper, Scorpion. And so I rock up and this one guy's like, hey, man, do you want a chicken wing? And I'm like, hell yeah, I love chicken wings. Yeah. And I, I grabbed that thing, man, and I annihilated it. And before I knew it, I was in the worst pain I've ever experienced <laughs> in my life, man. Like it was, <laughs> I already had gut issues before this, but this felt like it just stripped everything you know I, I didn't sleep that night um the worst gut pains i've had almost in tears and literally the next day i wake up and my life is completely changed like uh, all these foods i could previously eat i couldn't eat anymore like i was having reactions to everything and uh turns out i developed some um, some crazy histamine salicylate gluten uh and dairy issues so all these foods I would just attempt to eat that I would normally have, I was just wiped out. And I'm like, well, what? So I just can't eat food anymore. Is breatharian the, the way of life now? And man, like it, it was, it was insane. And I, I went from doctor to doctor to naturopath to naturopath. And uh, they eventually figured out that I had SIBO or small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, which, yeah, I've heard a lot of shit about that. So I don't even know if it's real, um, but yeah, I, so they, I had that. Um, my IBS was apparently just severe now than, than you know, it was just moderate before. And, uh, and, and yeah, so like I developed all these issues. They put me on all these supplement protocols. Um, and I spent thousands on supplements over the years and herbal extracts and that just to try and get better. And it got to a point where I just felt so helpless and lost. And, you know, I would get better and then I would go to shit. Then I'd get better and then it would go it would be horrible and like to points where my entire body was like I was the embodiment of a red rash you know like my torso my face my back my groin and it like it was those moments where I'm just like you know what I can't do this mm. doctor thing anymore like I didn't know doctors like yourself Dr. Chafee existed I just thought you know this is insane no one's helping me no one wants to help me so I just thought I'll take it into my own hands and started listening to a lot of podcasts and taking advice from, yeah, people like um, like Ben Greenfield. I was doing a lot of the biohacking stuff uh, yep. back in the day. And, uh, and yeah, so then cut to about, what, a year and a half ago or so, I was doing Paul Saladino's animal-based diet. So I was just doing uh, fruit, honey, and meat, but... I wasn't thriving at all. Like I was still messed up, man. And like, yeah, I, I just didn't know what was going on because food was so limited. And I'm like, well, what's the, what's the problem? Like I'm on this animal-based diet. And um, then I actually come across one of your videos, Dr. Chafee on Instagram. And that's when I got the, the remembering of uh, seeing Sean Baker on Rogan's podcast in 2017. Um, and then, oh yeah, it's sort of around 2019, I tried Carnivore for two weeks from Michaela oh, nice. Peterson and Jordan Peterson. Yeah, so they were the ones that sort of got me really into it. So I, I jumped on the bandwagon, but two weeks was just insane to I eat only meat back then. And so I, I didn't last very long. And uh, yeah, then I got on the Paul Saladino thing. And then, yeah, come across your videos, Dr. Chafee, and I started doing just I guess you call it the lion diet and man, like all my symptoms started to clear up again. 
like the, the skin issues went away the the joint pain the anxiety like the big one anxiety like it, it just just beautifully just, <laughs> ah. and that is one of the biggest things i noticed because you know when you've got anxiety all the time and you're in like flight mode that honestly can fuck your life up man and especially when you stand up yeah. comedy you know like you're you're already at all-time panic mode and you're about to perform to 200 people like it was hard man and like having diarrhea on stage and like just trying to hold it in and like don't do it man not in front of these not in front of this crowd you know like <laughs> that know. Was... <laughs> maybe, maybe that'd be the biggest gag yet you know maybe they just love it you know <laughs> there were a few times i'm like yo i'm about to shit myself i gotta get the fuck out of here you know <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah man and now here i am over six months doing carnival um i i have dabbled like i don't know if you guys do the same most likely not definitely not but like say the other day about a couple of weeks ago i was like i wonder what honey would do to me right now and i had like the smallest little smidge on my finger and I felt like my thyroid was going to explode, man. Like it's, it's just insane. The reactions and how, how, um, how sensitive I am to these foods that I was eating all the time back then. But like now I actually have a reference of how good I can feel and, and there's no turning back for me. Like I'm on the train. Yeah. Well, that's the thing too. Like yeah, people, people don't realize how bad they feel until they get off it. That was exactly my thought when I got off this stuff. And I look back at how, I, how amazing I felt now and compared that to the rest of my life and realized like, I've, I've felt like garbage my entire life. That's not okay. Yeah. And, you know, talk to people like, well, you know, I don't, I'm not really having any health issues. I actually feel pretty good. So do it. And I was like, yeah. you don't even know how exactly. bad you feel. <laughs> it's, it's, you don't even I have no idea. And then, yeah, you're right. It does get worse. You know, you do get more sensitive to these things. A, you're seeing the contrast. You're like, I don't want any part of that. But also, you know, you just get, you know, just like any other, uh, you know, like drug or alcohol or anything like that, you become more sensitive to it. You know, you, you, you build up a tolerance for these things over time. And then when you're not eating these things, you're not exposed to them. You don't need to produce the, the enzymes and things like that, that break these things down and detoxify them as uh, you know, to such a degree, because you're not encountering it. Your body's very efficient at that. And so, yeah, you do notice a lot more. And so sometimes that can be very uh, helpful to people when they slip up and go, ah, oh, is it that big of a deal? And I start eating something like, yep, yep. Nope. That's a big deal. Nope. Don't want that. And, uh, you know, so, uh, it's, it's good that you, you came across it. I'm the same way. Like I, some of those things slip in, I just I'm not having it. Like for instance, I was over, I, I was over uh, at a friend's and there was, they were like cooking dinner and things like that. And, um, uh, they had some like pieces of chicken there or whatever. And like, I was just like, Oh, is that, it didn't look breaded, but it had sort of something I was like, is that bread or anything like that? They're like, um, no, no, I don't think so. I think it was just, you know, sort of fried up. I was like, okay. So I had like literally one piece of this stuff and like, and like, I'm sore today now. Like I went to the gym. I'm not, normally not sore. Like, it's not that bad, but like, I noticed it. It's, it's not, it's not what I, what I normally feel like. I normally have no pain, you know, my back pain, you know, there's no back pain, no stiffness. Now I'm just a little bit sore, a little bit stiff. And I'm like, that's bullshit. There was crap on that chicken. And so, <laughs> you know, and like, it does that to you. And, um, you know, this level of soreness wouldn't have batted an eye at this, you know, when I was like playing rugby and things like that, I would have thanked God for this level of soreness. So it's not like it's, it's out of control, but I notice the difference. And, you know, when, when you go from just not having any of that, in your body and, you know, have not have any soreness and stiffness. That's, that's nice. That's nice to have that. It's nice to not have pain all the time. You normalize it. Don't you? Yeah, you do. Yeah. Well, you have to, because it is normal. That's your life every day. You're in pain. So you just, you got to suck it up and deal with it. You know, I was going to say, yeah, I've done the exact same thing with like, you know, a bit of potato with dinner, <laughs> something like that. Um, and you just like the instant bloat. Or like, you know, having too much dairy mm -hmm. and you know, just, it sort of reminds you, it's like, oh, I used to feel bloated all the time. I used to feel bloated after every meal mm -hmm. and, you know, and then lethargic and, and then a bit of a headache and all that sort of thing. But when you go without it for so long, it's just, it's such a shock when it happens. Yeah. It's not, it's not nice. And you're not understanding why you're just like, wow, I'm just, I'm just sore today. I'm not really feeling good. You don't know what's going on, but now you kind of do, you know, now you can associate that with things that you're eating and re recognize that like, actually these things are really actually causing harm. You know, it's interesting. 
I think it's a good reminder too. Like it's mm. a bit sadistic, but I think, yeah, it's, it's a good reminder. Cause like, yeah, a couple of months might go by and I'm like, oh yeah, this is normal. And yeah, I have a little bit of honey and I'm just not for six, but like not even just the next day. It's a few mm. days, man. Like um, I remember I had coconut water. Oh, it was a couple of months ago now, but um, yeah, instantly anxiety skyrocketed for, and it stayed that like that for, probably like four or five days afterwards for 250 mils mm. of coconut water. Like, yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah. And, and you were saying that you had like IBS and things like that. What other sort of issues were you having um, that have, have since cleared up or have they cleared up? Well, I talked to a lot of uh, like doctor mates here and they suspect that I might have Crohn's, but because oh, wow. I just bailed, yeah, I just bailed on the doctors i never found out because i was just like look i'm out of here i don't care what i've got i'm going to fix this myself very stubborn mm -hmm. and um and, and yeah so that could have possibly uh, been a thing but i've also got a, a bone disorder called osteochondritis desiccans that i've had since a, a child and um so that's been a big factor but um even like vitiligo that i didn't realize that i had um that got really bad when i was you know, uh, eating grains and, and whatnot. And I just started getting all these like white patches over my, over my arms that wouldn't go away. And then I realized, oh, this is like an autoimmune thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, same as rosacea. I've had rosacea on and off since teenage years. Uh, Pity rhesus rosea. I've, I've had that uh, on and off as well. So like a lot of, a lot of skin issues, but um, I've had leaky gut like for long periods of, of my uh, early adult life um but yeah and then just the anxiety and and depression uh pretty constant through through adolescent days too so but mainly the gut stuff man that's been the worst because like there's been periods of my life where you know i've had diarrhea for six or seven months straight and nothing can you know figure it out so it's like you know people were telling me oh dude you're gonna have a a, a week's worth of carnivore diarrhea and i'm like Pfft. Man, that, that ain't nothing. That ain't nothing. Man. Like you try half a year of, yeah. of diarrhea. Like, yeah. So yeah, it's it's a lot of the gut stuff that's been my biggest thing, but still a bit of a mystery, but suspect yeah, sure. Crohn's. Okay. Has has that gotten better? Oh yeah, yeah, significantly. But um, as I was telling you when the the zoom cut out, um, that wagyu steak that I had, that mm. is like that brought me back to the old days of how just nauseous and sick and uncomfortable um, I could feel. So that sort of brought me back too, just like having a 250 gram Wagyu steak. Um, so yeah, and like, man, I am worlds, worlds apart better. Like it's, it's night and day how good I'm feeling. Like I'm running five Ks like most mornings now that wouldn't even be a, a thing you know back in the day because like my bone disorder all my knees and my my ankles are just jacked but mm -hmm. um up at 5 30 run by the coast for 5ks and i'm like what's next you know it's yeah it's it's worlds apart man how different i feel and um yeah there's no turning back for me like i i, I finally feel my, my optimum and that's probably stacking other things like doing a sauna uh, a couple times a week and doing ice baths a couple times a week. So like stacking certain lifestyle choices. Um, so it, it's probably a mixture of all that, but it's obviously meat that's, that's healing me. And mm. I've, I do have a, I think a, a, a bit to go, like I'm not there because years and years of illness is probably not going to be fixed with six months of carnival. So um, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I, I, but I'm, I'm leaps and bounds ahead of where I was for sure. Awesome. And the, and the vitiligo, has that filled in? Yeah. Filled in on my arm. Oh, well, you got Marcus really, so you can't really see it, but yeah. it's, um, it's in a lot of my arms, but I've still got speckles all over my legs, but it, mm -hmm. it sort of just looks like, you know, a cool little universe. So it's not, not that bad because, but I had like patches on my arms oh, that right. were like going like really white. So, yeah. but yeah, most of them have filled in. That's really cool. You know, that, that was something that I heard a friend of mine, uh, in Europe, they actually said they, they just followed me. They didn't tell me, but they were like, they ended up trying carnivore. And then they told me like, wow, I feel so great on this. And actually my little, I went away, you know, and, and started feeling in, which is crazy. You know I mean? Like, because you'd think that like, once those, you know, melanocytes are dead, they're not going to come back. And then yeah, there you go. They do, uh, or they can anyway, apparently. And so that's, that's really, really cool. Like the, I would have expected, 
the process to stop and the antibodies to go away. But it was very, very interesting to see them actually regenerate and, and, mm. and produce uh, pigment again, which is really cool. And uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Like, you know, the more and more and more people that do this, the more and more problems that we see actually get better. Auto, I, I've yet to see an autoimmune issue that doesn't, that doesn't get better, which makes me, you know, very, very uh, confident that it's really a direct cause of eating the plants and, and producing an immune response to some of this garbage that, that are in plants like the lectins and so on. And, uh, and you remove those and your body stops making antibodies simple, you know, and you don't get that cross reaction. Yeah. So do you think it's like just a, a buildup of toxicity over the years and then boom, you've got, a, you've got Crohn's or you've got, you know, vitiligo because of, it's just a built up of like all the, I guess, toxins that are in, you know, the plant defense chemicals and whatnot. It's hard to say exactly what's going on, but, you know, I think one of the, the competing theories that I think is, you know, probably, you know, describes things better than other, other theories is that it's this idea of molecular mimicry where your body will react to certain things like lectins uh, or certain lectins and, or other molecules that the plants use as defense chemicals when they get through into your body with, you know, from leaky gut and things like that. And they're not supposed to be in your body. They're not supposed to be in your bloodstream in your system, but they get there and your body recognizes these things as foreign objects and, uh, you know, potential, you know, foreign pathogens. And so it, mounts an immune response and attacks them. And for whatever reason, you know, you have some sort of genetic similarity that, or, or you have some genetic predisposition that makes some of your proteins, some of your something on the surface of certain cells, um, similar enough that those antibodies sort of stick onto them because they're mindless. They, you know, they don't know what they're doing. There's just a chemical that goes out and it reacts to certain things, but it's very specific for a specific, uh, um, you know, molecules. And so that's close enough that it sort of half partially sticks to something on your, the surface of your cell and it tags it as like, Hey, this thing has to die. And then your body attacks that. Um, but you know, it used to be that people think that molecular mimicry, your body would get sensitized through those antibodies to one of your own self antigens. But that, ne that never really made sense to me because your, your immune cells, don't really have the ability to attack your own cells. They go through a, a, a rigorous process when they get they get made, go to the bone marrow and the thymus and things like that. They they don't get let out if they respond. They, they they're introduced as these immune cells are maturing. They uh, are introduced to a lot of antigens in your body, and if they react to any of them, your body kills that cell. So your body's doing this very very carefully. And so you really shouldn't be able to react to your own cell. So what, and it also fits because um, that your body's just attacking these other things and mounting an immune response to that. And part of that immune response happens to have a partial effect on your cells as well. And that's also evidenced by the fact that when you remove these foods and you remove those lectins and other little things that this is reacting to, the autoimmune condition goes away, your body stops, and the antibodies reduce and eventually go away. And so, you know, we see that, I see that, you know, all the time. I, we have dozens of Hashimoto's patients, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, where you, you can actually measure the, um, um, the antibodies that are attacking your, your thyroid. And uh, they go down, just goes down, go down, 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 steadily down, and then go back to normal. So, you know, that's, that's what I think is going on. And so for whatever reason, your body's maybe fighting this off, not really doing too much with it, or maybe you, you're, you haven't damaged your gut lining and your body enough to allow all these things in, in enough numbers that your body can react to it. It's hard to say. I don't, I don't think we have a very good answer for that yet uh, on why things start at certain times and not, not at others for people. But I think that that's the process is that our body's reacting and responding to something and mounting an immune response to that thing. And there's overflow. It's just making a whole bunch of antibodies that just get into your system and Hey, you know, it sticks onto this thing. That's not meant to be, it's trying to suck up all the lectins and things like that, that are around, but they happen to stick to some of your cells. And when you get rid of the lectins, you stop producing the antibodies. They stop, 
having that overflow sticking to your cells. And so that's what I think is happening. I had a similar thing with uh, histamine. That was my, my big thing. And like, so I could eat histamine foods and it would be fine. But when it reached that tipping point and um, I would obviously have an overflow of histamine, it took me like a few weeks to recover from that. Even though I was eating bacon last week with no problems, I'm eating mm -hmm. bacon today and I'm having the worst GI issues, you know, irritability, all the, all the symptoms, you know, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just amazing, man. Yeah, you got to be careful with, with bacon too, just because they, they generally do add sugar and things like that. And, and just pork in general, like obviously, um, uh, you know, if you've been eating it before and you've been having a good time, then that's, you know, that, that's reassuring. But a lot of people with autoimmune issues have, have a real hard time with any amount of sugar, any amount of anything like that, but also with pork, chicken, fish, eggs, egg whites, certainly, and dairy in general. You know, and, and, um, you know, like you, you mentioned Michaela Peterson, I saw her talk about a video in a video, um, maybe last month where she said, uh, she cannot eat pork at all, that that actually gives her a worse flare up and reaction with her, with her rheumatoid arthritis than mm. like fruit would, you know? And so, so that's actually a big trigger. I, mean, I for wonder her if, as well. if she ate free range pork yeah. that has been, you know, eating a more natural diet. I wonder if she'd be okay. I yeah. guess in the, in the States, it's hard to find. I would, yeah, I, um, I would, I'm very, you know, I, I think, I think yeah. that, 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 that probably is the case. I'm very suspicious of what is being fed to pork and, and chicken and things like that. And like the eggs that the, the chickens come from, what are they being fed? Yeah. You know, just something cheap, exactly. some, some cheap feed. And, uh, you know, especially when they have to keep them sort of contained and, and, uh, you know, barn raised and all these sorts of things. I mean, they're not in a cage, but they're not out foraging either, you know, and that's, that, that is hard to do on a, on a large production scale. Um, but yeah, so I, I would just imagine, I imagine most of it has to do with the animals eating, you know, like, like you were saying, Scotty, you do great with beef, you do great with meat. And then you had Wagyu, which is, you know, fed tons of grain and sugar and beer, you know, from birth, like that's what it's eating. And that's how it gets all that intramuscular fat. You know, that's what's happening to people when they eat all that stuff too. They, their, you know, their biceps look like Wagyu steak, you know, which is why bodybuilders <laughs> who do that, you know, they're not really gaining anything by that. They're actually hurting themselves because their muscles certainly aren't going to be as strong or as robust. They're not going to be able to work out as much, you know, because they don't have a lot of lean mass. It's all just clogged with fat. And, um, you know, and so what that cow was eating to get that marbling, you know, obviously that's not what the cow was meant to eat either. And some of that's going to translate to you and you had that big reaction, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a pig that's just eating what it's not supposed to eat the whole time, like it's probably going to give a reaction to. Yeah. It's really interesting though, because as I was telling you, I've got access to like all these great farmers markets. So I've gotten pork and chicken that have been Part, well, marketed as pasture raised and like I, I, I do trust these guys too and um every time every time pasture raised chicken or pork it okay. annihilates me and I, you know i love my chicken and just no hot sauce but yeah, you know i love yeah. my chicken and did, um it's like i get a pretty severe reaction that takes me days to get over did they um did they tell you what they're feeding them do they give them any feed or are they just forage animals Apparently they're just foraging out. They're getting the bugs and the grubs and the insects mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. But yeah, like I would have to assume that they would be getting some form of like something. grain at some point, because, you Let's know, see, if you've got yeah. a whole, yeah, if you've got a whole lot of chickens and, you know, like there's only so many bugs on the ground that, you know, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to, hard to do that on a, on a production scale. Um, that's another thing too, like with pigs, they're generally given slop, you know, they're get, given like, you know, food waste from people and restaurants and things like that. That's, that's what pigs are given a lot of the time. And, um, I don't even know what, what a pig's supposed that's to be. Good eat. question. You know? <laughs> I, mean, I think I they're a bit no omnivorous. I know they eat yeah, people yeah. sometimes, you know, so maybe people, people are their natural diet. Yeah. It uh, just reminds know. me of those mob movies, yeah, man. That's what I pigs. went to straight away. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 well, and, um, you know, my grandfather, you know, grew up on a farm in the Northwest and, um, or sorry, in the Northeast. And, um, and he said that that was just, that was just part of farm life that you knew you did not let kids go near the pig pen, 
you know, and little, little kids, little toddler, you know, you had to keep an eye on them if you had pigs because they were dangerous and little kid, little Timmy would go over and look at the pigs, all these cute, you know, fuzzy pigs like, Oh, that's so cute. And you just, you'd never see Timmy again. You know, that was just, you just knew that because they, they just stomped it, chomp it down, man. They just, they wanted that. They're and massive too. They're, they're ginormous. Massive. Yeah. Know? Yeah. They're very big. And big mouths, you know, big teeth, big jaws, you know, the crunch down a kid, no problem. And, and people like, I think you know, everyone who's seen snatch knows that, you know, like, <laughs> you know, all the things you have to do, you have to take the teeth out, take all jewelry out, but it can crunch through bones and everything like that, you know? And, um, and uh, yeah. And there was like some sort of equate, like how much pounds of meat, how much pounds of, of like people, like a certain cow would do. So like, so for this many pound person, you needed wow. this many pigs to finish them in this many hours. And it's just like, okay. And, and who are you apart from someone who clearly feeds people to pigs? You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so Scotty, what, what exactly are you eating? Um, so I, I yeah, no, I'm, it's pretty much exclusively beef and lamb. Um, but a bit like uh, Michaela Peters' mum, she could only eat lamb. At, uh, I think, I don't know, she might still only be able to eat lamb because beef reacts to her. Beef mm. would react with me as well. But, um, you know, when I got a few months into carnival, because I was eating only lamb when I started uh, the this last stint of carnival. And it took about, what, maybe two months. And then I introduced beef again and it was fine. So, um, yeah, it's pretty much just lamb and beef is, is my diet. I might like maybe add, I don't know, some snapper piece of fish, like once a month or something like that. But even still like the histamine levels in that can sort of, uh, do a number on me. And yeah, so it's just, you know, I, I hear people like, uh, say like Judy Cho say, you know, bring some, br bring some fish in the mix for, for, for the good fats and that, but, and like, I listen and then I get a reaction and it's like, oh man, just stick to beef and lamb. Like there's just nothing else that compares. Mm -hmm. And there's, 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 you know, I mean, I, I, and I think you know, Judy would agree, like introduce some fish for those who are able to, you know, and mm -hmm. um, you know, but if you're getting, if you're getting beef, uh, especially like, you know, grass, grass fed, finished beef, uh, plenty of good yeah. fats in there, tons of good fats. And um, you know, there's a lot of people like, you know, like, uh, you know, the Andersons, like Charlene Anderson and her husband, who I'm blanking on the name, they've been eating exclusively beef ribeye for 20 years, 23 years, 25 years at this point, and, wow. and thriving and doing really, really, really well, you know, raising kids completely on ribeyes, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and doing really well because of that. And um, so, you know, you can do it, you know, and there's certainly plenty of people that just eat beef. And, you know, all the people that were living you know, sort of in the middle of, of continents, they weren't really by, you know, major water sources with a bunch of fish available to them. They were just eating beef, you know, or, or mammoth or whatever, you know, yeah. and, uh, and doing great, you know? So I think you do fine, you know, just, just eating the meat that you are able to, and that makes you feel good. And, and, uh, you know, that's it. You know, just, just listen to your body. It's amazing. You never get sick of it either. Like I, yeah. I still crave like, you know, I had um, a, a nice little lamb roast just before, like half a kilo of, of lamb and fills me up for like a little bit. But then like I, I crave it again, that that fat and, and protein, like I've just eaten it, but I'm craving it again. It's it's the it's it's amazing. Like you never mm. get sick of it ever, mm. ever. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's because your body's telling you it wants those nutrients. You know, I, I think that's what that is. Uh, there's other things that you want because you're used to it. It gives you comfort. Um, you've acquired a taste for it, or it's an addictive substance like sugar and carbs. But you know there are there are things that give that positive response because they're good for you. And so I think that that's uh, that's why you never get sick of it is because it just it's always tasting good because your body wants it. But when it you know your body doesn't want it, it doesn't taste good. You know, yeah. and so I think that's a, that's a good judge and marker of how much you're supposed to eat as well yeah just feel it so that's what i was just going to ask you guys like what's your meal frequency and like what's how much do you guys sort of eat um yeah, yeah i'll um I'll, I'll jump yeah. in i was eating like three times a day um up until recently uh, and we recently chatted with asher from primal wellness last week and he was telling me how he eats breakfast and then dinner 
and because I've been working, I've been going into an office regularly lately. Um, like I haven't wanted to not to skip breakfast and then maybe skip lunch and try and make it through to dinner. So I've just said, all right, breakfast and dinner. And it's been working really well. And I just kind of like eat till I'm full. I'm usually not that hungry in the morning, but I'll, I'll try and eat as much steak and eggs as I can. And then I'll just wait till dinner. So I haven't eaten since I've gotten home today and it's the afternoon, it's like 7 p.m. Um, and that period's been great. Like just having a, you know, two breaks from eating, you know, while I sleep and then morning to night. So that's working for me now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I tend to eat once a day. Usually if I'm working out a lot, then I'll need to eat more. But um, usually, you know, just get like a whole bunch of, you know, fatty steak and until I'm full and then I'm good. I'm good for another 24 hours or so. Um, I surprisingly less than people would expect, you know, for like someone my size and, um, you know, that, that definitely goes up when I work out, when I'm, when I'm lifting a lot, then I definitely need more, uh, to, to, to build muscle mass and to maintain that muscle mass. Like, um, I'm sort of like 105 kilos now. And I like to be when I'm working out heavily and regularly, I'm usually right 110 and, you know, very toned. And I like that. Like, I like, so it's like 240 uh, pounds for people that don't do kilos. And, uh, but I have to eat, I have to eat to maintain that probably like two kilos a day to maintain that and do and, and go to the gym. And otherwise, you know, even just like 105, 100, like I, I maintain that pretty easily just on one kilo a day. And, um, you know, so, I mean, I eat less than some like old ladies that like join our group, you know, like, eating six pounds a day. I'm like, Jesus, that's a, that's a lot more than me, you know? And, um, you know, but I think that, you know, they're coming from like a nutritional yeah, deficit you know. and their body's just like, Oh goodness. Yes. Get this in you, you know, and they're trying to, they're trying to repair a lot of things. Whereas I mean, I'm, I've sort of been in a steady state for years now and I'm just, yeah. just, you know, my body's just working. And I think that's where like I've been because I was doing three meals a day and probably eating half a kilo each sitting. And um, yeah, it felt great. It felt fine, but uh, quite similar to you, Simon, I've gone to breakfast and dinner and that's just seems to be two meals a day spread across the day. Like nice. it feels fantastic. And same thing, maybe like a half a kilo uh, in a, in a sitting like a, a steak or, you know, lamb roast or whatever. Um but yeah, I think like what you're saying, you've just got to listen to your body, eat till you're mm. full. And yeah, like it, it does the work for you. Absolutely. Cool. cool. All right, well, we better wrap there. Scotty, thank you so much for joining us today. And um... no worries. Got... Wait, one last question. I've yeah. seen the podcast with you guys and right. Adam Kavanagh. Have you guys got on the, uh, the blue <laughs> testicle yet? <laughs> Shut up. Oh, dude, that's <laughs> hilarious. Oh, my God. Yeah. Who makes that? That's so funny. Oh, dude, it's grass fed too. So, like, it's um, grass fed it... bull testicles. I bet <laughs> it work. Has... Well, yeah. Man, honestly, it gives you this like vitality and vigor that you don't oh, I'm feel. Like, it's, it's, it could be placenta, though. <laughs> 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 but, but honestly, dude, man, it's gives you this like oh this this extra extra kick and look, I, I there's people like um i'm watching liver king at the moment because he's gone natty now um has he he's had, oh, has it yeah, no, but he, was yeah, natty, he said he was he? he said he was <laughs> i trust him i trust the internet yeah oh. yeah Dude, he's yeah. eating like two pounds i think he said two pounds of bull testicle a day spread out over the day that's because that's so, because he stopped all the hgh and, and testosterone you know, yeah. also bull testicle extract that he was in injecting into himself. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow, that's a lot of that's bull like, testicles. That's hilarious. I'll have like, yeah, I'll have like four four capsules or something. Like that's that's plenty for me, bro. But um, uh, whether it's placebo or oh, dude, you feel like, <laughs> oh, love it. That's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, that's oh. funny. No, I have, I have not tried that. <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, you know, bull testicles, you know, it's going to go, it's going to go there. It's going to go in your, your hot dogs and, and, and sausages because they got to use it for something. You know, they, they castrate these steers every year and they've just got millions of these things just running around. So, um, they got to go somewhere, you know, yeah. and but that is too funny, but I've, you know, I've never seen a testicle for sale no. anywhere. It's a yeah, shame. Thank God. It's not cheap yeah. either. It's not cheap. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, that's funny. Where, 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 did the, where does he even buy bull testicles? Where, where do you buy that? You know, 
ball storm? Ask no questions. Just no, put like, the nuts in here. No questions asked, you know. No. Yeah. No, thank you. I think, I, I think, I think I'm fine with, with steaks. I'll, I'll just stick to that. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks so much, guys. It's really good. Pleasure. Thanks, Scotty. You're a legend. Yeah, no worries, man. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for coming yeah, on, buddy. Yeah, and if you if you if you really want the real experience, you there's uh, every year in Montana, in Missoula, Montana, uh, when they when they castrate all the the, the you know the young uh, male cow and the bulls and the um, you know rams and things like that, um, they have what's called a testicle festival, and they just have yeah, exactly, I swear to God, and there's just like all these like like. Um, like food trucks and things like that, just like serving up, you know, roasted sauteed grilled balls, you know, and like, and, uh, and so people just go there and they just, they have this whole big festival. where They're just eating testicle and testicle related foods, you know, it's, wow. it's absolutely hilarious. I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could do the real deal, the real thing, put it in a capsule. Yeah. I'm, I'm good. But like, I don't know about the real deal, man. That's a bit, that's a bit wild. Okay, you gotta get it straight from the source, you know, just, just yeah. rip it off <laughs> yourself, you know? And like the Adam Cavanaugh sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, just uh, get in there. Um, well, I'll let you know how I go if I do. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thanks, Scotty. Good. All Thanks, right. Man. See you guys. Cheers.